Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's a wonderful, beautiful day, not too hot, not too humid here in Orlando, and I appreciate that you're all here today. I'm a little too short for the bottle of water. So. I'm Gina Marchese with the ASUG team. I manage the Leadership 2.0 program. Mm -hmm. Welcome today uh, to our Leadership 2.0 panel, uh, Drive Innovation Through Personal Disruption. I just want to take a moment to introduce our, our guests. For those, I mean, we've been running this program for two years, and I know many of you are aware of, uh, of the Leadership 2.0 program. It's really been an invaluable resource for our volunteers, our speakers, and all of our members who are wishing to improve, enhance, and take advantage of leadership skills, both for their personal and professional growth. We've gotten some great feedback. The evidence of this packed room is just, just a blessing. I'm really thrilled that you're all here to join us today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We have Lisa Leslie here on my left. She is our leadership. She's our leadership 2.0 team captain, four-time gold Olympian, WNBA All-Star, uh, and one of our just favorite friends. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. We have Dr. Uh, excuse me, Whitney Johnson. She's the co-founder of the Rose Park Advisors. She is also the author of our book here, Dare Dream Do. She has worked very closely on the concept of disruptive innovation and applying it in a personal way. She's done several TED Talks, and she's just an expert on the subject, and we're really looking forward uh, to what she shares with us in the panel today. We have Bridget Chambers, our esteemed uh, ASLEG CEO. She's been with the organization and has done tremendous things in the last four years, and again, a testament to your, your uh, your attendance here today, Leadership 2.0 is, is her baby, if I should say. Really proud uh, that she's able to join us today. And last but not least, Dr. Janice Pressler, Dr. Janice as we like to call her. She's the CEO of the Gabriel Institute and the author of, of the book at Dr. Janice, Thoughts and Tweets on Leadership, Teamwork, and Team Ability. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll take over from there. Thank you so much, Gina. I will be your host. Just picture us as the view, and we're here going to have a conversation. The Leadership 2.0 view, that is. And uh, we're really excited that you guys could all join us. We have some amazing speakers, as you know, and we're going to start, start with Whitney Johnson, who you guys all just got her book, hopefully, Dare. Dream. Do, dare, dream, do, uh -huh. which uh, I, it was very interesting to see what people said about whether they were in a stage of dare, do, or dream, um, but I want to ask you first, can you just explain to us, here at SAP, a lot of times, uh, they're always coming together with groups and saying, let's come together, let's solve some problems, but let's not be disruptive. That word oftentimes used more in a negative way. Can you explain to us yes. about disrupting yourself and how you use that as a Absolutely. positive? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I, I do. I want to share with you one disruptive moment I had when I was in seventh grade. Um, I really wanted to prove to everybody that I wasn't a good girl, and so I sat at my desk and started tapping my pencil over and over and over again so that my teacher finally would send me to the principal's office and I could be a bad girl. Uh, and it worked. <laughs> but that's not the kind of disruption that we want to talk about today. Um, the type of disruptive innovation, how many of you are actually familiar with that term, disruptive innovation? Okay, so a handful of you. So for those of you that aren't, let me just recap quickly. It is a term coined by Clayton Christensen of the Harvard Business School to describe a, a low-end or new market innovation that eventually upends an industry. Let me give you a specific example. The disruptors enter in at the low end of the market, think about the Japanese or Korean automakers, and then in the pursuit of profit, they gradually produce higher performance, higher margin products. Now the established competitors think the US automakers could aggressively defend against an attack by the low end disruptors. But they don't because it makes more sense for them to pay them for themselves to move up market until, of course, it does make sense to defend, and then it's too late. So that's what a disruptive innovation is at its essence. Thank you. So Bridget, I have to ask you, you've been here at ASA, 
would you consider yourself <laughs> the way that you, you know, I think we look at you as more as the fixer. You've come in, you've revamped SAP. Would you consider your behavior and what you bring to this company as disruptive? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying this and I know that there's this town hall that happens on Friday with a lot of you and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining how that goes. Uh, yeah, it's disruptive, but I think disruptive is fantastic. I think, I think a fit, healthy mind is always disruptive because you're never satisfied with what's in front of you today. You've got a great, you know, kind of push past that and, and find the next place. And so um, I hope to uh, always be considered disruptive. And if you think about it from an ASUG perspective, quite frankly, all of you are disruptive. You could be sitting in your desk or in your territory or in your place at work, but you're not satisfied with that. You're here today to gather education, networking contacts, continue to differentiate yourself. And you do that so that you can go back to your organization and be disruptive in a very valuable way. So uh, I, think it's, I think it's a fantastic thing for all of us to consider one another. And Dr. Janice, I know that you come from the, as a psychologist, the team ability is, is your whole thing, but let's look at the science. Is there a science behind personal disruption? Completely. Well, there's the, there's the S-curve, which Whitney will tell you about, which you can read about in the book. But um, I've been thinking about disrupting the way we think about leadership and the way we think about teams for a very long time. And uh, so teamability is a completely new technology, so it is pretty disruptive. Uh, that predicts how people will work together on a team. And for all of you, if you just let me know who you are, give me a card or whatever, if you'd like to experience it by yourself, for yourself, I'd be happy to give you one. Okay, thank you. Whitney, when you look at disruptability and the fact that our economy is sort of has been in a decline and people have been out of jobs. Do you feel like um, when you have to disrupt yourself, have people been forced to do that because of the economy or is it just something that we all go through depending on which stage in life you're in? Well, I, I think absolutely some people have been forced to disrupt themselves, but I think that there is, um, even as the economy is rebounding, we're sometimes seeing that the productivity gains don't actually lead to new job creation. And so, um, so, so yes, that's sort of there's an economic difficulty, but I think broader than that, there is very much a secular trend that's happening, which is if you take a look at, I actually have some quick figures here that I jotted down. Um, 43 million people in the United States, um, or 35 to 40 percent of the private workforce, currently works as an independent. And over the next decade, that's expected to go to 65 to 70 million, which is a growth rate of 6%, well above the 1%. Even more stunning to me is that of the people that are independent, depending on whether they're a millennial or a boomer, 40 to 70% of them are choosing to go independent. And typically when someone's gone independent, they've decided to disrupt themselves. So I think very much there is a secular trend at play here where knowing how to disrupt yourself, how to jump to a new curve, is a skill set that is well cultivated and will hold you in good stead. So that's sort of my part of my follow-up question then is how do people begin? Let's say you're in a job, you're in a job, everybody has a job here, but you're not in your dream job. You're not where you want to be. How do you begin the process of disrupting yourself? And I remember when people were signing you, when you're signing your book, you know, some of you said you were doers, right? Some of you said you're still dreaming, and some of you said you, you're in a dare stage. So how do you begin to disrupt yourself? If you're in a job, you're, you're probably satisfied, but you know that you have a dream to be somewhere that may be bigger, better, or maybe smaller. You may yeah. want to pull back. Everybody's dream is not to have you know, the, the biggest job and the biggest home and the biggest car. Some of us sort of want to live our dream, that things that we're passionate about that we would do for free. Right. Uh, and it could be a pullback. Yeah. Um, so let me um, talk about the S-curve just really quickly sure. and then move to that because I think that that will um, uh, sort of lay the groundwork for what I want to explain around that. Um, so many of you are likely familiar with the S-curve, which is, you know, helps you understand how uh, disruptive innovation will be adopted. What I've discovered that you, is that you can also apply it to personal disruption. So at the low end of the curve, the first 10% or first few thousand hours, um, growth is pretty slow. And so that helps you understand why discouragement can set in. 
Think about every time you started a new job, those first six months seem to be really tough, and then it gets easier over time. Then once you start to move up the curve, you accelerate into competence and comp competence and confidence. confidence. And mm -hmm. then once you get at the top of the curve, then you've hit mastery. And what will happen there from a neuroscience perspective is that you'll no longer enjoy the feel-good effects of learning, which helps you understand why boredom can kick in. So to answer your question then, is that the way that you know that you need to disrupt yourself is you may, first of all, not need to right now. You may be going for a C-suite job. You may be able to see exactly where you want to go and get from here to there. So in which case, you don't need to disrupt yourself. But if you're at the top of that curve and you feel like you're bored, then that plateau that you're on can actually become a precipice. And whereas you may not disrupt yourself, you may get disrupted. And so that's when you know that it's time for you to start thinking about what do I need to do next. Okay, and so Bridget, when you think about being disruptive, what are some of the risks that come along with that as a leader or even if you're working in a group? Well, I think risk is present in everything you do. It's a, you have to take a 360 view of where you are and consider risks. They, they might be professional in nature. Uh, they may be personal in nature. They might be financial in nature. Uh, if you're thinking from an organizational perspective, you could expand that and think from a customer, from a supplier, so on and so forth. Uh, but anytime you make a change, we all know this, there's a significant amount of individuals uh, and groups that are uncomfortable with change, right? Uh, somehow it's not until the change becomes the present and people have accepted it and it's really no longer change anymore, it's yesterday's news, that people become comfortable with it. So anytime you endeavor to go outside of those normal boundaries and be disruptive, even if it's purposeful, uh, you risk having negative feedback, having questions, so on and so forth. Uh, I've learned that if I'm getting feedback that seems constructive in nature, that I'm going in the right direction. Because people are not necessarily questioning the value of the program, the decision, and if it's personal in nature, your own direction that you're going in. People are questioning it because you're stepping outside of something that is normal and comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I take constructive feedback or even feedback when it seems more so than constructive, which sometimes happens in our world, right? Uh, I, I take it as a signal that we need, to, we need to listen. You don't have to be a leader by consensus. So just because everyone isn't agreeing with you doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. But you need to have your ears open and listen to what people are saying. Take it in. And if you're still on the right road for yourself or for your organization, you press forward. You just press forward and press forward, and that constructive feedback will turn into a bit of a compass for you so that you know how to work with those that are dealing with change now, right? And sometimes, it's funny, it's the things that are most disruptive and uncomfortable for people dealing with change that later become the thing that they're so comfortable with because they just didn't know what was on the other side of that change initiative. So I, I think risk is an imperative in many ways. You just have to make sure that you're embracing it in a way where you've, you've mitigated what you need to and, uh, and, and you've got a way to explain and continue to take in feedback so that people continue to understand what you're doing as you move forward. Communication's the key. Communication, okay, so, so Dr. J, we're gonna call Dr. Janice Dr. J since I come from the basketball world. When you talk about <laughs> teams and disruptive behavior, how does that affect the whole team when you have sort of an individual? Um, I remember on our conference call we talked about, you know, you brought up T.O., Terrell Owens. You have these certain athletes or people uh, that are in groups that are really in their moment of doing and daring and they're moving as an individual, but how does that affect the whole team? And if they're being disruptive, can it be uh, seen in a positive way and also in a negative way? It depends on if it's a positive disruption or a negative one. You know, in T.O.'s case, he was, he is a physically magnificent, a can do things better than everyone. And we've all worked on teams where we've had the rock star who can do things that we can't do, except that they can't get along with anybody. And so it takes the team and it just rips it apart. You know, if you're going through change, what people really want to know is, what am I, gonna, am I going to be allowed to contribute in the way that really makes me feel good? I mean, isn't that really it? So if you're leading a change, doing anything like that, if you just let people know, if people really understand that the way in which they contribute is going to be valued in the new way that we're doing things, 
then they will see their place and they'll see that it's not very far off and that it isn't very unknown because they'll still be doing the same kind of thing that they, they do and with other people who do the complementary things. But if all of a sudden it's so insanely disruptive that we're going to, uh, one example uh, from a very simple uh, thing was, uh, was a, a branch bank that, where they decided that everyone had to sell something every day. Well, if you know most people who like to help you with the bank, they don't really like to sell. They just want to be friendly and help you. Um, let's just say the turnover went way up and deservedly so until they got rid of that. Think about what that means in any change management project that you're doing.